last session, uh, what did we discuss last time? That is the fifth session. So, we had started discussion on ancient Indian economy. In that, what all we discussed? As we have seen from the Angus medicine data, uh, India had 33 percent share on 00, 0 and even in 1000 it had a share of 28 percent. So, it was distinctly developed economy compared to the whole of the world. Now, we are trying to answer whether we are just going by one particular article or one particular author or there are other evidences also. For that, we are looking at more evidences. I think I had I think I had told you earlier that in my view that Angus medicine figures are also understated. They are very, very conservatively stated. He has not made any overt claim. So, we are looking at other aspects. So, there are three major sectors of any economy. The first one is agriculture or in the olden days it was as primitive as gathering food. So, what were the references we looked at for agriculture? Very, very olden days, there are some cave temples in Bhim Betka, which show agricultural equipments being used, something like 3-4 lakh years before. So, usually westerners still recently used to refuse any history before 6000 years, saying that no, 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 there are no proofs and how can you have such an old history. But those paintings which are now proved to be very old, show agricultural uh, not only that agriculture is done, they had tools which were used for lakhs of years. Then there are also other records of uh, rice being grown or other crops being grown in India from a very ancient time. Of course, now we will feel usme itni badi kya baat hai, but usme badi baat ye hai ki westerners have been refusing this history. They were saying, no, 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 you can't have that history. Now it is slowly coming out that no, you had a reasonably developed agriculture from past. And then we had also seen uh, about irrigation. So, what was the special feature about irrigation? Large number of ponds, tanks, small and big lakes, especially in South India, almost I mean more than one in each village where water used to be stored and some other references that large part of uh, agriculture is through the irrigated water. Okay, So, that was about agriculture. Then what about industry or manufacturing? So, urbanization we get some data especially from Harappan townships or at other several other locations also. And who, who else, who was the expert who studied it? Paul Bayrock. Paul, ba Paul Bayrock had done a detailed study on urbanization and manufacturing. That also says that 30 percent of manufacturing is coming from India, which was I think in as late as 1820 or 1830. So, that is another strong proof for manufacturing. So, as I was saying, ki pehle to they used to deny that you have anything, then they say, okay, you may have agriculture, but manufacturing not possible. Now, the data shows that Indian economy was prosperous, not just on agriculture. Agriculture is required, but you will get food. To get the surplus, you must have industrial output, which can be exported. So, that was through manufacturing. And what about the third aspect of economy? Uh, education to baad mein trade or other services. So, what are the references for that? We have seen that India had lot of trade surplus, which was evident from the movement of gold from other parts of world to India. Because of trade surplus, it had to be settled through gold. There was no other way of settling and there are also other uh, references to trading and especially maritime uh, advancements in the shipbuilding and all such types of things required for trading. 
and other two sectors of economy. What are those two sectors? Education and science and technology. Because if economy is advanced, naturally education should also be good. And education, if it's advanced, it will have impact on economy. So, what are the available information about education? Vikram Shila is there. South India also had lot of universities. It is not that only some part of India. If right from here, west side, mein Gujarat, se, tak, even the eastern parts of India, there were several centers of higher learning. Bohot sare usme proofs hai, but we have only seen two. One is in a very ancient times, that is in the form of ancient universities. The other references were at the beginning of British rule. So, what are the uh, references about beginning of British rule? There were three surveys done by Britishers in each of their provinces. What were the three provinces which they controlled? They had Calcutta, that is the first one, then Bombay and Madras. All the three provinces, they did a survey. Around 1810 to 1830, 1840, before bringing in new form of education, they had done surveys about existing schools in India. Those surveys are uh, well documented by Dharmapal. So, Dharmapal's books are based on those surveys. So, what are the main features of those surveys? One is literacy rate was very high. District nahi, every village. Every village had a school for primary or little higher than primary type of education. Many villages having 2-3 also. And anything else? Then socially we see very important message that people of all castes attending it. There was no apparent discrimination between the caste and by religion also. Almost people from all castes and religion, religion means mainly only Hindu and Muslims, but they were attending, the numbers are well listed in those surveys, caste wise, ki how many students from each caste. Now you find that now higher education has significantly gone down. The sir, earlier record were some 2000, 4000 years old, this is only 250 years old. India is already under foreign rule for 700-800 years. So now, sizable downfall in the higher education. But still, primary education is quite uh, significantly made available to all classes of society. Higher education is very low. But still, uh, you remember anything about higher education, even in those surveys? That was more in the ancient times. That was in the first uh, type of records. Nalanda or those old universities. Because now from 1000 to 1800, you are almost under foreign rule. So, most of the big centers are already destroyed. Big and what we can call as a university level centers. These are primary or at max high school type of. But despite that, especially the North India survey says that there are 100 centers of higher education per district. Something like a college of today, not really of the level of university, that was still there as per those data. And they were surprised that this system of education is much better than the Britishers, what Britishers had at that time in terms of quality. And after that, Britishers sought to destroy that system and then they started schools in at a district place, which became very costly for people to travel and get the education. So, these were references about education and any other sector? Science and technology. Science and technology ke kya kya references hai? So, ancient Granthas give lot of details. There are details about surgery, metallurgy, medica, medicine, about uh, some references with manufacturing that I didn't go too much in detail 
but there are lot of references to advanced science and technology most of it is destroyed so we don't get lot of objective data isliye i didn't put it because we are really trying as a course in a very objective fashion so i didn't put it but if you thought of little go into more if you are willing to accept thode thode supportive evidences you can get lot of more information but anyway in the course i think it's enough if we know that there was science and technology to support the level of manufacture which we see in the gdp okay so and then uh, next part what did we move to then we have gone to studies by ambedkar dr ambedkar had given lot of studies about economy and commerce in india there were two three reasons why i chose one was because ambedkar is very very critical about indian culture so he giving means use kam ho nahi sakta you can find other authors who would have made much much better claims but ambedkar is very critical second his studies are all from top class american universities his professors also will not accept any claim if it's not substantiated very strongly by proof even if you actually have gone to those links it is also mentioned that how he found how it was very difficult for him to convince his professors that these things exist in 1915 remember at that time no american will accept that india will have such level of developed commerce etc so so we can be very sure ki ye sab objective hai there is no there is no hype or anything involved there okay so what were the studies by dr ambedkar three four studies actually we saw there is one study by dr ambedkar known as problem of rupee that studies the finances in provincial finances during british india that talks about suggestion for demonetization of course i have not gone much into it because british india records otherwise you can find from here and there so i have not really discussed it more what else we did did we discuss ha huh. there is one good critic by ambedkar titled marx or buddha that is actually much later it was in 1956 just before he decided to enter into buddhism so but what are the features of that marx or buddha aise to bahut bada critic hai we have only seen two three paras which are relevant to our course where he has criticized that communists are only interested in material development whereas for a healthy development of human kind you need material plus spiritual development which is suggested by our ancestors particularly by buddha and what what is a term he has used do you remember which is very interesting he has used the term called as fat pigs pigs ko bahut khilaya to bhi they would become fat pigs that's that's how if even if human beings make material progress they would be not better than fat pigs unless there is development as human being which is not possible without spiritual progress remember uh, remember he has written in 1956 when ussr was considered very strong and progressive which he has written also in his words so i have not changed that he says that russia has developed like anything 1990s ke baad pata chala ki it was all also a bubble but at that time it was felt that material development is great despite that he has said that it is not enough for proper development uh why i picked up was one because it was linked to our earlier thing second it also brings in major features of indian economy because indian economy and indian business which is the core of our course talks about certain special features which are mostly holistic in nature generally western thought is only about money or economic development indian development thinks about overall development which is in a way brought about in that critic yeah any other thing which was there in that ppt trade ke bare mein do you remember there is ambedkar's 
uh, thesis on development of global business, especially of Western Europe. Here they said that after the land route of trade was blocked, so after advent of uh, Khalif and domination of Muslims in the Middle East, they dominated both land routes and ships also were not allowed from Arabic Sea. Till that time, Eastern Europe was well developed. So Italy, Venice and all these areas were far better developed than Western Europe. And major reason was the trade from India. So all the sophisticated items which used to go from India used to be traded in the Eastern Europe. When this trade was stopped, Eastern townships dried. Western Europe was already not in good shape, was further in bad shape. And at that time, they thought of finding out new trade routes. That new trade routes were in the form of America, in the form of encircling Africa and coming to India. And after that, Western Europe developed like anything. So again, two, three takes a, take away for us. One, to India was highly developed or a collaborative evidence that India ka trade is so important for them that India ke trade ke bina they can't even get the basic necessities. That's why they had, to, they had to develop new ways to reach India. One, second point, the development of Western Europe which we see later period, actually these are the seeds of the development. That's what he has argued, that finding of new routes. Then they found America, they found colonies in Africa, Vagera Vagera. Pele wa Africa me koi jata nahi tha. People were directly crossing Europe and coming to Asia. So, because they were having then better navy, they could attack the African countries or American uh, countries in America and then they got colonies. So, the development which we see in latter 100, 200 years, these are the roots. That's what Dr. Ambedkar has argued. So, we see from that Angus medicine chart that post 1750 and particularly post 1800 significant downfall of Indian share and also Chinese share and rise of Western Europe and then of US. And those periods have been already studied and this that is studied under that chapter or a thesis called as drain of wealth. How India was systematically drained and the wealth was transferred to UK or to other parts of Europe. So, who has put in that theory? Drain of Wealth. Drain of Wealth is a book written by Dadabhai Nauroji. So, he has studied lot of, a lot, especially British records and written a big thesis on how the wealth was drained. I hope you know about Dadabhai Nauroji. We have discussed this, is it or no? So, he was the MP in the British Parliament at that time also and then he has dug out all the records and of course has the courage to publish it in the Britishers time with lot of proofs and subject uh, and objective uh, uh, data as to how the wealth is, is being drained he has said because in those days itself he had written. Then there, there were other authors also, who, anybody remembers any other authors? So, I think we had Ranade, then R.C. R.C. Dutt, there are other authors who have shown, we have not gone much deep, much into it because of recent time ka hai, aapko yaha wahan se wo padne ko mile ga hai. But just to have a connectivity of what we have today versus what we had in the ancient times, the drain period shows how the wealth was taken out. So, today we will see some more work of Dr. Ambedkar and then we will see the ancient currency because on that also some uh, data is available. And then if time permits, we will go to Indian business models. So, Dr. Ambedkar has written this thesis. Uh, when did he wrote? His first work in 1935, which is presented to Columbia University. So, he has written in detail about commerce in ancient India. The first one is of course, agriculture. Uh, he has specially written about the respect for agriculture as a profession, which was the highest. Generally, there were very few laborers in agriculture. People used to own the land and cultivate their own. 
लैंड जिससे क्या होता है विच वॉज अक फीचर ऑफ इंडियन इकोनॉमी कि एवरी पर्सन इज मोर ऑफ अ सेल्फ ड्रिवन मोर ऑफ अ एंटरप्रिनर सेकेंड देर इज लेस एक्सप्लाइटेशन ऑफ लेबर इन अदर पार्ट ऑफ वर्ल्ड देर वेर वन पर्सन हैविंग ह्यूज लैंड बाद में जमींदारी टाइम आने के बाद इंडिया में भी वैसा हुआ बट इन दो डेज देर वॉज नथिंग लाइक जमींदारी एवरी पर्सन हैविंग ओन पीस ऑफ लैंड एंड देर वॉज ऑल्सो डिसेंट्रलाइजेशन which is one of the features of indian economy so there will be 5000 rice growers not ki 100 rice growers honge jiske paas bada land hai there will be small small pieces of land owned by several rice growers agar several operators hai to automatically it takes care of monopoly there won't be any monopoly but it needs more cooperation because individual person ke resources limited hoge so they have to pool the resources so the level of cooperation was pretty high between those farmers they used to share resources because har ek ke paas resources kam honge unless they share they won't be able to do good so that they used to share we were some features he has also written a lot about devotion to cow and he has justified a lot because the whole economy is cow based economy agriculture needs cows and that's why they are considered as reward and there is lot of shraddha about cow and cow should not be killed it contributes a lot to the agriculture second part is about organization of labor industry and commerce in that the first point was very very low level of slavery again here we should compare with the times he is talking about so slavery was very very high in most other parts of the world generally one race used to capture other race and make them slaves permanent slaves jaise if you read old bible references the jews are slaves in the hands of israelis etc you such type of things you will find in all other history here there is no slavery there was negligible amount of slavery only to pay the debt if suppose the person becomes in debt the person will have to be slave for one season or two seasons till that debt is fully paid so otherwise the slavery was low again that also ensures more of a decentralization because her person khud ka khud owner hoga aisa nahi hoga ki there is one zamindar who has got 100 or 1000 slaves then he has written about i think we had come up to this about various industrial classes which are again very interesting from the management perspective so one was this vaddhaki this is the embodiment of a carpenter ship builder cart maker and all such type of pro professions this also i think we had seen kammara so various types of metal items which are clubbed under this then pasana kuttaka these are masons so there was considerable degree of organization and certain trades which were localized in special villages they used to have associations so what those associations are called that's that used to be called as shreni the shreni is very akin to today's corporate companies that's why i also remember it otherwise there are six seven names given there and there used to be specialized streets in most of the villages villages or towns then there will be a uh, regulation by headsman mostly self regulation as was promoted and these guilds used to have heads or elderly people this also he has mentioned about tendency for hereditary occupations so there was no caste rigidity at that time as much as we see now but there was somewhat a rigidity of occupation that might have brought made the caste uh, very rigid at a later time but these were uh, these were serving as training centers as those guilds so their next generation used to get training there kabhi kabhi dusre occupation ke log wahan aake wo guild mein training le sakte hai this also he has mentioned about good roads connecting different parts of india so ramayana refers to road starting from ayodhya to rajgruha which was the capital of kekatiyas so he has given details about various roads which are in both north as well as in south india this is a very again interesting from management angle 
that trade was not only individualistic it would show some type of corporate commercial activity as well as partnership now in our next ppt we will see more details of this that generally books say that ancient system may there was only barter but for such a advanced level of trade only barter won't work so barter was might be there in long long back after that cows used to be exchanged or rice used to be exchanged slowly you need some standardized uh, currency then only the trade would be possible that was also there though it's not there in this particular thesis it's there separately so then currency had also evolved though it was not from a royal authority it was issued by big people something like the banks of today and this is also very important there was no taboo on loaning of money which again we feel isme kya badi baat hai but in those days especially in islamic countries the loaning of money was completely banned and in other parts of world also there were restrictions whereas here finance is well developed so people can easily uh, invest as well as others can get loans and those interest rates sometimes were regulated so along with trade many times civilization also we can see was passed on to many parts of europe or africa so a good amount of the mercantile class in africa or in parts of asia are of indian origin that's not only after britishers it was there from ancient times people had traveled there and they used to do trade then you see references from egypt syria etc that most of these costly items used to come from india which may include spices or aromatics or scented wood and so on uh, i don't know what this q fir is if you have any clue you can tell me it mentions of q fir are to be found long before the time of solomon but kafir is a muslim reference so ye to christian early old bible ka reference hai not even the christianity wala bible jews bible so this is talking about the solomon's time so india and judea judea there was trade during solomon's time now he is claiming that but it is not only during solomon's time it's much older than that that's what you can very clearly see from references in the old bible isliye that kafir i don't think is that kafir referred to in the islamic texts this is so i also don't know what it is but this is what he has actually written so these biblical evidences are also supplemented by linguistic evidences so you might have read somewhere there is lot of similarity between hebrew language and tamil so perhaps ancient tamilians went there and settled or they used to go there frequently for trade so tamilians had lot of maritime trade so exact links or reasons pata nahi hai but he has given references about several words from tamil having very close uh, similar uh, meaning in some other word in hebrew this i gave because I, earlier i think also there was one question about what were the items which were exported so he has given lot long list of 19 items which was exported out of india this he has given from the old tamil uh, text which talks about thriving town of murichi so which says that uh, do you know what it is i don't know maine to itna hi padha hai maybe some tamilians might know it so where the beautiful large ships of yavans these yavans refer to people from europe or people from turkey this is nothing to do with any religion or anything because this is much much older 4 3 4 000 years old what is interesting is they bringing gold so they are saying that ships full of gold are coming that was to settle that trade surplus uh, this is one more uh, article by dr ambedkar which where he has written about shudras bhi usme aur bahut sari cheeze hai about caste etc but relevant here was there used to be only three varnas in the old society and there was nothing like shudras shudras emerged from kshatriyas this is what he has said so shudras are not coming from outside anything or uh, the suppression of shudras etc was not there in the ancient indian times that's what he has written in fact there was no such class like shudras in the ancient indian times 
हाँ दिस इज अ बुक रिटर्न सॉरी आई सेड आर्टिकल एक्चुअली इट्स अ थिक बुक वी हैव जस्ट फुट टेकन ओनली वन पैराग्राफ फ्रॉम इट बिकॉज उसमें बहुत सारे बाकी चीजें हैं दैट्स नॉट रियली रिलेवेंट फॉर अस ओके नाउ स्लाइटली वील गो टू द न्यू टॉपिक सो वी हैव सीन नाउ वी हैव डिस्कस्ड अबाउट एंशियंट इंडियन इकोनॉमी और कॉमर्स और ट्रेड फर्स्ट फ्रॉम अवर अर्लियर पीपीटी बाय डिफरेंट ऑथर्स एंड देन बाय डॉक्टर अम्बेडकर नाउ जस्ट टू थ्री स्लाइड्स वी विल सी कि इंडियन इकोनॉमिक मॉडल है क्या Yes, we are saying that there is some model and there is a lot of prosperity, etc. It's too difficult to really summarize. But I have just taken two, three people from current times, not very ancient references like Chanakya, etc. Uh, from current times, who have written about principles of Indian economic model. So one of them was Gandhi ji, where he has said that economics that hurt the model moral well-being of individual or a nation. are immoral and therefore sinful so as i was talking earlier indian economic model has to go hand in hand with ethics i think hamare pehle humne ppt mein bhi dekha tha ethics in economics so anything which does not have the moral does not talk about moral well being actually is completely immoral not only immoral it's sinful and second is that that economics is untrue which ignore or disregards moral values this i have taken first because gandhi ji is the first amongst the three authors which i am putting uh, the second one was by again by dr ambedkar where our object in framing constitution this is more from discussions in the constitution uh, constituent assembly to lay down the form of political democracy which is of course one which is already there second is also important but generally ignored that is also to lay down our ideal of economic democracy which he used to talk about decentralization and other things this he has written of course in 1950s the third person which has who has written more in detail about the indian economic model is din dayal upadhyay he has very in a very good words summarized what is the crux of indian economic model so he says that as i visualize for india a decentralized polity self reliant economy with village as the base we cannot rely upon superficial western models concepts like individualism socialism communism capitalism and need to be rooted in the timeless traditions of our ancient culture and he was of the view that indian intellect was getting suffocated by western theories and ideologies and consequently there was a big roadblock on the growth and expansion of bharatiya thought this he has written in 1960s so who was din dayal upadhyay anybody is aware he was the founder of bharatiya jansangh which later on evolved into bjp of today so he has written many other things of political type but he has written he has given a concept known as integral humanism which in very good words brought about what we are talking about in the indian economic model what is even more important is you can see this he has written in 1960s jab yo log sab ye sab ideas ko haste the because communism was on top with ussr and china doing very well so in he says that all these concepts are superficial us was also on top so now people are rethinking because communism is gone and the western powers are in debt but he has written it about the times when actually these powers were really dominant but that time itself he said that our intellect is suffocated because of the western concepts so here he has said that primary concern is to develop indigenous indigenous economic model that puts the human being at the center stage that's why it's called as integral humanism and it is opposed to western capitalist or marxist social, uh, capitalist individualism or marxist socialism though welcoming to western science so it seeks a middle ground between capitalism and socialism evaluating both the systems on their merits while being critical of their excesses so every human being is not just about a a, a sort of a economic being so every human being has all these components body mind intellect and soul 
normally in a materialistic philosophy it only cares takes care of body at max body and mind basic necessities ek bar fulfill ho gayi then person becomes dissatisfied person won't be happy by just by earning more money more money more money because body or mind ko satis mostly body ko hi satisfy karne ki limit hai uske baad usko kuch maza nahi aayega then person will look for intellectual pursuit and beyond that going to atman or more of a shanti type of pursuits that is what is the crux of actually indian indigenous model uh, and put in other words there are four universal objectives of kaam artha dharma and moksha here again western only uh, models only talk about these two artha and kaam means you earn money and you enjoy after a point the enjoyment doesn't give much of satisfaction you need some moral values which are given by dharma and the ultimate goal will be moksha that's what indian model brings about so again he has claimed that the problem of both capitalist and socialistic ideologies that they consider the needs of body and mind only of course the needs of body and mind are very important if they are not met baki sab nahi kar sakte but they alone are not ultimate this is also very interesting quote by uh, maharshi arvindo he has written 100 years before that india will rise rise again on the ruins of west in he has written in 1911 where it was very difficult to write even before the first world war when western powers were really very very dominant okay now we'll go to one more aspect that is uh, there are some more there is some more information about the currency because we are looking at different aspects of economy and commerce so as i just said ki without currency you can't think of so much so advanced level of uh, trade or commerce so that for that also some references are available so this we of course know that currency serves these purposes so unit of account medium of exchange and store of value uske liye unit of account is very important because medium of exchange sometimes you can do in barter but how will you fix the value unless you have some unit of account that gives i mean that intuitively so there has to be some unit of account without which you can't think of more of trade so in rugved there are references to currency so this is a study by dr devil frawle so vedic time itself it says that because of unsuitable medium like cows there were other medium especially there is a reference to word called as mishka that was used uh, that is referred in the vedic times it appears to be a standardized item so jaise yahan kuch references diye hai that rushi kakshivat receives a present of 100 mishkas 100 horses 100 bulls to ye 100 mishkas jo hai it appears to be some standardized items और उसका रेफरेंस कई बार आता है सो so, ये अथर्व वेद का भी रेफरेंस है दैट हंड्रेड निष्कास थ्री हंड्रेड हॉर्सेस टेन थाउजेंड काउस एंड सो ऑन सो दिस इज टॉकिंग अबाउट सम आइटम ऑफ मेटल टू बी यूज्ड एज अ करेंसी तो दिस इज देयर इन सम शत वैदिक टेक्स एज वेल एज इन जातक स्टोरीज एज वेल एज इन शतपद ब्राह्मण यू सी दिस रेफरेंसेस ऑफ निष्कास In Manusmuti, Rajeshri Manu defines nishka as equal to a weight of four suvarna or three twenty rattis, and its relative weight is equal to one karsha or eighty gunjas, perhaps of one eighty grains. Then, of course, during Ramayan and Mahabharat time, also you have references about currency. Then you might have seen this from this Indus Saraswati Valley civilization. you can find such stones which are used or usi type ka stone piece you find in large numbers from that now it is being argued that they must be like sort of today's currency or coins that's why they are found in different cities similar type of item found at many places because they were used more like a currency so uh, i hope you have read about this that initial sites which are harappa and mohenjo daro which are very famous like they were only near today's sindhu river 
that's why it was named as Sindhu civilization. The latter sites, several sites in Rajasthan and Gujarat, etc., are far away from Sindhu River. That's why new research argues that there was Saraswati River, and then on both sides of Saraswati River, you find a lot of uh, sites which are getting excavated, which are reasonably evenly spread. Otherwise, Sindhu River, it is only on the Indian side of Sindhu River, so which appears illogical. If there is a civilization near river, people will naturally have cities on both sides. They can't only stay on, only on one side. Then during Mahajanapada's time, there are references to these types of coins. Round nahi hai, thode longish coins, but made of metals. This is from silver. So this is, this is standardized, which shows that it appears to be coins minted by some king or by some traders. Then this is the coin found in Lydia, in Europe, parallel to the Indian coins. And these are coins in the Mauryan coinage. Now they have become sort of round. These are post-Mauryan coins. What is very interesting about this, this was found in Greece. What is more interesting about this coin is, one side of coin is in Indian Lippi. The other one is on Greek. That shows the level of trade which must be there, which is very rare in those days. Because there is no medium of communication or transport available, nahi hai. still such coins are there. So see, these have inscription on the left face is in Greek and on the right face in the Kharoshti script, which is prior to Devanagari, the script used in India. Uh, so here you can see here, the successors use uh, bilingual coins. This is during Gupta period. After the after those coins, these are much better developed. These are uh, mostly coins made of gold. So what these were known as these coins? Swarna mudra to hai, but usko aur ek word bhi hai. Why is Dasra celebrated? Do you know the story of Dasra? It talks about King Ragu wanted money, so he is ready to attack Kuber. Kuber doesn't want to be attacked. So Kuber Varshao Karta hai, Suvarna Mudrao ka, which are known as Mohras. So Mohrao ka Varshao Karta hai, but specific reference hai. It doesn't say that he gives wealth or something like, which again shows that there must be currency and they were gold currencies. Isliye us din sona lutte. Kyoki that time lot of gold coins came from somewhere. And the, those coins were known as Mukras. So rich people or high value trade used to happen in Mukras. This is prior to advent of rupee. Huh? Olden days, Mukras were common. Not necessarily common in a sense of common man, but high value transactions used to happen in such type of coins. And how did ru rupee evolve? What does a rupee mean? Rupee is made of what? Rupee actually means silver. Raupya in Sanskrit means silver. So rupee, silver coins were later became more common, especially post-Muslim attack. So old coins, abhi tak jitne coins deke, you hardly see any silver coins. Later period you can see them. Before that some other uh, references also can be seen. This is about hundis. So from very ancient times, there used to be a bill of exchange or a sort of promissory note which was called as hundi, which was used for transfer of money. So you can deposit money with trader at one place, get hundi, go to other place and you can encash it at the other place. This is how hundis used to work. Jiska settlement hota tha, two-way settlement. That, that's the only, I mean only then these hundis can work. So if you are depositing money in Mumbai, you want money in Delhi, you can go there and encash it, sort of like a traveler's check. So there are many references, one references by this Abul Fazal, this is in 1596. He says that from a very, very long time, such instruments exist. So in Kautilya Arthashastra, you, you find several references to controlling of credit or controlling of interest rates or regulation of banking. 
then this is paper currency uh, generally it is believed that it was developed in china so paper currency or hundi mein ye farak hai ki the hundi is a negotiable instrument encashable only at against a particular person this is for uh, like today's currency note you can exchange it with anyone this is some european uh, some again some chinese note this is a swedish note but much later it's in 1661 the chinese note is in 600 ad uh, this i think i already asked you so silver coin reference you only see after 1000 ad and it was made of silver so it was called as rupiah from rupiah the word rupaya came this is again from dr ambedkar's that problem of rupee uh, again you see that uh, muslim kings used to issue this silver coins whereas hindu kings still used to use issue the gold coins so south india much later even as much as in 1500 ad the silver coins were in use Uh, sorry gold coins were in use in south india these are some coins in uh, by east india company so we have seen broadly we have discussed about indian economic model which is a background our main work is on what is indian business model and from business model what evolves is a management model so now we are going to more of a business and management model Uh, to add one more thing about those ancient india we have talked about shreni which was a corporate form similar to today's corporate form you can see a very good article and very good thesis by vikramaditya khanna who is a very senior professor in us he has written a good he has done a good lot of articles and thesis about uh, corporate forms in ancient india कि ऑर्गेनाइजेशन स्ट्रक्चर कैसा था हाउ वॉज द ओनरशिप स्प्रेड हाउ दे यूज टू ट्रांसैक्ट एक्सेट्रा ही इज अ प्रोफेसर ऑफ लॉ सो ही हैज रिटर्न इन मोर फ्रॉम अ लीगल एंड कॉर्पोरेट एंगल नाउ बेस्ड ऑन द प्रिंसिपल्स व्हिच वी सॉ देयर इज अ इंपैक्ट ऑन द वे द बिजनेस इज डन एंड दैट इज इंडियन बिजनेस मॉडल एंड दीज आर सम ऑफ द फीचर्स ऑफ इंडियन बिजनेस मॉडल सो रिलेशनशिप फेथ गुडविल बेस्ड कम्युनिटी ड्राइव फैमिली बिजनेस और लेस डिपेंडेंस ऑन स्टेट दीज आर फीचर्स ऑफकोर्स जब हमने ओवरव्यू देखा तो वी हैव ऑलरेडी सीन इट बट नाउ लिटिल मोर विद इन डिटेल नाउ फर्स्ट वन ऑफ द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फीचर इज फैमिली ओरिएंटेशन ओवरऑल वी हैव सीन दैट द होल इंडियन सोसाइटी इज हैज अ फैमिली ओरिएंटेशन दैट फैमिली ओरिएंटेशन कैन सीन इन कैन बी सीन इन द बिजनेस एज वेल सो देर इज अ वेरी लॉन्ग ट्रेडिशन ऑफ फैमिली बिजनेसेस देन predominant proprietary pattern finance most of the initial finance generally comes from family savings so it is both ways for family it is a motivation to save and when the young person from family wants to start business that becomes the source of finance then there is also support of relatives and friends etc and borrowings from local financiers using the family goodwill because the family is known people will give funding not based on the way venture capital or such things work on uh, the attitude of self denial and dedication as we have seen again in the principles it's not just about money it's also about moral values so there is a attitude of self denial that helps in bring, building the goodwill and passing on the uh, wealth plus goodwill to next generations then there is division of responsibility sharing of risk etc okay now is this family orientation good or bad some good aspects some bad aspects would be there so what could be plus points what could be minus points so difficult to move to another business thoda sa core competence jaisa ho jata hai matlab aaj ke terminology mein we call it when so corporate is in a particular uh, area they won't diversify same thing happens with family so family as a family business hoga to youngster in the family people will not encourage to go into other professions any other first of all many times there may not be standardized practices because personal relationship based hai to best hai ki nahi to aage ki baat hai there would be practices definitely but not documented and standardized practices the person head the helm will say ki ha mujhe pata hai kaise karna hai and i am been doing for 50 years or 100 years etc इसके लिए नया पर्सन नए कुछ बेस्ट प्रैक्टिसेस लाना चाहता है तो शायद लोग एक्सेप्ट 
नहीं करेंगे दे वुड से नो नो नॉट रिक्वायर्ड वी नो एवरीथिंग एनी अदर थिंग मोनोपोली ऑफ बिजनेस बट आई थिंक इट इज नॉट दैट ट्रू थोड़े से मोनोपोली ऑफ कम्युनिटी हो सकती है बिकॉज द होल मॉडल इज डिसेंट्रलाइज सो नथिंग लाइक द मोनोपोलीज ऑफ एम एनसीज और बिग कॉर्पोरेट विल मोस्टली हैपन बिकॉज देर वुड बी फिफ्टी फैमिलीज डूइंग इट हंड्रेड फैमिलीज डूइंग इट बट थोड़ा कभी कभी यह हो सकता है कि मोनोपोली ऑफ कम्युनिटी हो सकती है बिकॉज न्यू पीपल ओनली ऑफ दैट कम्युनिटी वुड बी वेलकम इन दैट बिजनेस दूसरे कम्युनिटी के पर्सन को अलाउड है लेकिन एंट्री करना डिफिकल्ट हो जाएगा तो उसका नॉलेज बेस नहीं होगा दीज पीपल आर ऑलरेडी वेरी डोमिनेंट इन द बिजनेस दे विल नॉट इजिली एक्सेप्ट अदर पीपल सो दैट इज वेरी मच पॉसिबल बिकॉज अदरवाइज द मॉडल इज बेस्ड ऑन डिसेंट्रलाइजेशन सो जनरली डिस्करेजेस मोनोपोली एनी अदर पॉसिबिलिटी सो शॉर्ट टर्म रिजल्ट विल नॉट बी गिवन मच इंपॉर्टेंस लॉन्ग टर्म और जनरली कॉर्पोरेट टर्मिनोलॉजी हम ऐसा बोल सकते हैं कि मोर देन प्रॉफिट मेकिंग इट वुड बी वेल्थ डेवलपिंग वेर एज प्रोफेशनली ड्रीवन बिजनेस द प्रोफेशनल इज देयर ओवर टू थ्री इयर्स उसको तो एक साल में परफॉर्मेंस दिखाना है एटमैक्स दो साल में ना उसको हटा देंगे तो उसके लिए तो इमीजिएट प्रॉफिट इज द मेन कंसर्न वेर एज यर इट इज वेल्थ बिल्डिंग beyond wealth building also goodwill building because you are going to be there for 100 years not as a person maybe but as gen next generations that's why you want to develop goodwill now for uh, i mean maybe 25 years before this was totally laughed at because profit building was profit making was considered as the objective in the those who call themselves as modern now because of mal practices in corporate world and several frauds people are sort of relooking whether these ideas are good because in a corporate culture everybody is very much concerned about immediate profit it might harm corporate interest in the long run in western world also most of the big businesses are actually family driven they may or may not call it but most of the big businesses are family driven so they want to develop at least their ancestors wanted to develop uh, business for the family and that's how they had a very long vision last 20 25 years may that vision kept on becoming short so now there is more of a discussion ki can the companies really uh, develop with that short short vision because ceo or the person in at the helm will only be concerned about immediate profits and the returns also are only based on the immediate profit profit of this year or next year whereas here it is very much long term kind of outlook uh, overall looking going back to the aspect of economy indian economy in general has significant dominance of non corporate or these type of family businesses this is slightly old data actually because it's from the book but almost all the sectors have a very high proportion of non uh, unorganized sector or non corporate sector professor vaidyanathan has written a very good book called as india unincorporated the whole book is devoted on this if you go to his blogs or if you just do some google search on unincorporated you can find many aspects of it because it impacts economy it also impacts business a lot even if you are in in big company you should be aware of this because almost all your suppliers would come from this category many of the services are purchased from this category of people because whole economy 70 to 80% is surrounded by small businesses there will be only few companies which are like big businesses 